We began our story of the Sabbath at creation. On the seventh day, God rested and made the seventh day holy. There was something special with this day. The Bible tells us that it was the only day of the six without confinement of a morning or evening. This day was meant to bring an eternal rest. After the sin of Adam, the world was plunged into an abyss of sin, death, and destruction and what was to be an eternal day of rest was cut short. That first Sabbath day was a distant memory as man had to survive in a hostile environment and the world fell into deep spiritual darkness. This was an era without rest and without a Sabbath day, but the world got even darker. In this era of man, there was no promise of an afterlife. Therefore, man assumed wrongs had to be righted in this life. What you sow, you reap in this life, for death held nothing but a forever silence. Injustices not punished in this life had little hope of ever finding justice. Good behavior, humans believed, had its rewards in this life or had none at all. Yet, Sin, hopelessness, chaos, and confusion tormented mankind because man was so genetically close to the perfect genes of Adam, their long lives, great strength, and creative mind gave opportunity to fall into depravity not known since. So much evil corrupted the world that God sent a flood to destroy humans. The survivors of the flood again debased themselves in filth and iniquity. Mankind created gods to make sense of nature and death. The worship given these idols of stone, including bloodletting and sexual orgies, human and animal sacrifice, could give them no mercy, nor could these grotesque and violent acts forgive the worshiper or reconcile him to the gods. God chose Abraham and his offspring to begin a covenant that would break through the disorientation and bring God down to earth to dwell with Israel, his people. God reminded them of the Sabbath and gave them sacrifices and a temple so that he could give humankind hope. God, the creator of heaven and earth, was present in Israel's temple and could be worshiped there. God gave them these signs and shadows of the great mystery prepared from the foundation of the earth. He was sending a Messiah to save them. Today, we live in a world that has 2,000 years of Christianity that civilization has built upon. We can hardly imagine the iniquitous times into which the light of Christ came. When Jesus made the blind man to see, it was also an allegorical story for all of mankind. The world was illuminated in truth, for the Savior 
Lord of creation, had finally come. But coming to earth, humbly clothed in the flesh of mankind, was not all. The long-awaited Messiah, Jesus Christ, was tortured by man, crucified, was buried, and on the first day rose from the dead. Alleluia! The reign of terror was gone. Sin and death no longer had the last word. Christ rose from the dead, conquering sin. Therefore, death was swallowed up in victory, and all heaven cried out, Where, O oh death, is your sting? With his death came a better hope. His life and death brought a better covenant, which was opened up for the entire world. Jesus became the high priest of an eternal priesthood, no longer from Israel, but from the order of Melchizedek. And with this new and better covenant came a new and better law. Through Christ as our high priest, we draw near to God. Jesus, the new Adam, brought into the cosmos a new world and a new era of mercy. The Holy Spirit was given as a new comforter. Nothing would ever be the same again. And the seventh day, a mere shadow of its glory as the Sabbath, would take on a deeper and greater meaning in the new covenant. Only a few years after Jesus' death, the apostles were joyously proclaiming the good news to the people of Israel. When certain Jews were confused about the Sabbath day, were Christians supposed to be circumcised as the entrance to the new covenant like the old? If they were circumcised, then of course they must keep the law God gave to Israel, including keeping the Sabbaths and the Passover and sacrifices at the temple. Many who alleged to have sat at the feet of Jesus claimed that Christians must first enter the covenant of Israel and then they may have Jesus as their Messiah. Other leaders disagreed, so Christians took the question to the apostles at the Jerusalem Council. Messiah soon realized that something far bigger had happened in the Christian era. They began to understand the great prophecies of a new heaven and a new earth as coming with the Christian era. The early church praised Jesus coming as bringing a new heaven and a new earth. The constellations were made new and they understood Revelation's images of the sun, moon, and stars falling as symbolic of a new order of religious time. A new year, a new month, a new week, and a new day. Time itself changed.
In their mission to spread the gospel, establishing churches all over the known world, the apostles realized they would have to appoint permanent leadership for Christ's church. Moved by the Holy Spirit, the apostles chose and anointed and consecrated honest, holy men to lead the churches when they left. Christians through the millennia have called these men and their successors the early church fathers. Among these men were also lay theologians and holy teachers. Some of them were personally instructed by the apostles. Others were of the second and third centuries and were instructed by the students of the apostles or their successors. Men such as Ignatius, Justin Martyr, Origen, Tertullian, Polycarp, Clement of Rome, Chrysostom, Jerome, Ambrose, and Augustine. These great men, many who gave their lives in martyrdom for the gospel, began to understand the meaning of the Sabbath and many of the requirements of the old law. They began to see them in relationship to this new and everlasting covenant in its new laws. Here are the writings of the early church fathers who Christ's apostles taught and anointed to carry on the gospel at a time when the New Testament was not yet put together. These men wrote about the Sabbath, and here is what their writings tell us. Barnabas, the new moons and Sabbaths he annulled, that the new law of our Lord Jesus Christ being free from the yoke of constraint. Ignatius, if therefore those who were brought up in the ancient order of things have come to the possession of a new hope, no longer observing the Sabbath. Aristides, the Jews erred from the true knowledge as when they celebrated Sabbaths. Epiphanius, Sabbaths, fastings, circumcision, being images and allegories, were transformed when the truth appeared. Christ is the great eternal Sabbath, of which the lesser temporary Sabbath was a type. This served until his coming, fulfilled in him. Sabbaths were the shadows of good things, and by these shadows we have apprehended the body of the good things now present, which were foreshadowed in the law and fulfilled in Christ. The Mosaic law had a Sabbath to keep us for the great Sabbath, the rest in Christ, so that in Christ we might enjoy a Sabbath rest from sins. For Jesus did, in fact, come to abolish the Sabbath, but he could not have abolished it if it had been other than his own. So the Sabbath of the law was in force until Christ's arrival. But he abolished that Sabbath and gave us the supreme Sabbath, the Lord himself, our rest and Sabbath repose. Justin Martyr the new law requires you to keep a perpetual Sabbath. If one is obedient to Christ, then he has kept the sweet Sabbath of God. Christ does not induce his followers to be circumcised like themselves, the Jews, or to keep the Sabbath. Clement of Alexandria the seventh day, therefore, is proclaimed a rest, preparing for the primal day, our true rest, 
By following him, therefore, through our whole life, we become impassive, and this is to rest. Tertullian. Good reason, therefore, had the Lord for pursuing the same principle in annulling of the Sabbath. The observance of the Sabbath is demonstrated to have been temporary. Inquire whether this giver of the new law, observer of the spiritual Sabbath, eternal ruler of the eternal kingdom, be come or no. That if he is already come, service may be to be rendered him. Irenaeus the Sabbaths taught that we should continue day by day in God's service. Moreover, the Sabbath of God, that is, the kingdom, was, as it were, indicated by created things in which kingdom the man who shall have preserved in serving God shall, in a state of rest, partake of God's table. Origin Origen argues that St. Paul was not impious to abstain from corporeal circumcision and from a literal Sabbath to turn the mind to the good and true and spiritual law of God. Didascalia Apostolorum If then the Lord, by the gift of his grace, has set you loose and given you rest and brought you out into refreshment that you should no more be bound with sacrifices, oblations, and Sabbaths. For it was laid upon them to give all these things out of necessity, but you were not bound by these things. Lactantius. He destroyed the obligation of the law given by Moses, that is, that he did not rest on the Sabbath. He did this not by his own judgment, but according to the will of God. Victorinus. Lest we should appear to observe any Sabbaths with the Jews, which Sabbath he, in his body, abolished. Pamphilus. They, Christians, did not, therefore, regard circumcision, nor observe the Sabbath. Archelaus God himself enjoins us, consequently, to rest continually from secular things, and this is called our Sabbath. This law was suspended over men, discharging most sharply its curse against those who might transgress it. As to the assertion that the Sabbath has been abolished, we deny that he has abolished it plainly, for he was himself also Lord of the Sabbath. In this, the law's relationship to the Sabbath was like the servant who has charge of the bridegroom's chamber, who keeps it intact till the arrival of the bridegroom. Eusebius. Christians did not therefore regard circumcision nor observe the Sabbath, because such things as these do not belong to Christians. If you have been watching the earlier episodes of The Story of the Sabbath, you know that the story of the Sabbath began at creation when God blessed the seventh day and made it holy but that the Sabbath was always supposed to be an eternal rest in the Creator, and that from the beginning this holy rest pointed to Christ. In fact, Jesus indeed is our Sabbath. And Christians were never, at any time, supposed to keep the seventh day as a holy day. The entire point of the Sabbath was Christ, but that was not revealed in the Old Testament. At Christ, the revelation began for the Christian church. The story of the Sabbath 
is now showing the process by which the apostles and the early church understood the Sabbath in its new covenant connection. It is difficult in a short sentence or phrase to express how clearly these men taught that the Sabbath was fulfilled in Christ. We posted only a small sampling of the texts written about the Sabbath by the early church fathers. We urge you to look up these references and read their context. We think you will be surprised at the unified theology on these subjects by the early church. While some Gnostic and Judaizer groups, such as the Ebionites, who broke off from the main apostles of Christ and started their own church, kept the Sabbath. However, Sabbath was certainly not their only difference from the Christians. Some of these cults rejected the divinity of Christ and his virgin birth. They rejected some of the New Testament but added to the canon of scripture their own, such as Gospel of Ebionites. They also kept all the Hebrew laws, such as Passovers. But even most heretical groups agreed that Christians did not keep Sabbaths. In our thorough examination of the early texts, we could find no dissenters among the Christians, no Christian leader, no apologist and no Christian writings from that time suggest that Christians kept the Sabbath as an obligation. Next, we will be watching how the Sabbath and Sunday are developed during the time of Emperor Constantine, the Edict of Constantine as well as in the early Middle Ages with local councils. Mm -hmm.